Good afternoon. How is everyone today? Good. God bless you. You know, I just came from Noah Community College, and they have a, a course there uh, about literature, and, and, and I always give one of the lectures every, every semester. They have, they have a round robin. Teachers give lectures on these different books, and usually I do novels, like I've done The Maltese Falcon, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Time Machine, A Walk in the Sun, which is one of, actually one of, is actually my, was translated into one, that's my favorite war movie, A Walk in the Sun. Um, I did The Lost Horizons, which is my favorite, really my favorite novel. And today I did, a, I did something a little different. Sigmund Freud. Civilization and its discontents. And I chose that book, you know, I chose that book months ago. And then when I went to that class today, I'm thinking, boy, does this tie in going to the Darien Library? Civilization and its discontents. And interesting, when you get into a topic like this, and I found something here by Sigmund Freud, talking about the human condition. Now, he, this was one of the last books he wrote. He wrote it, he wrote it after the First World War. So he'd been, he's well known at this point, right? He says, the truth behind all this, one so eagerly denied, is that men are not gentle. Women are, well, you know, this, this, starts with, this starts with the religious notion or, or, you know, you've been told this when you go to church on Sunday, love thy neighbor. What's he saying here? Interesting what he's saying here. Is that men are not gentle, friendly creatures wishing, wishing for love or simply defend themselves if they are attacked, but that a powerful measure for, of desire for aggression has to be reckoned as part of their inst instinctual endowment. The result is that their neighbor is to them not only a possible helper or sexual object, but also a temptation to them to gratify their aggressiveness, to exploit his capacity for work without recompense. Isn't that slavery? to use him sexually without his consent, to seize his possessions, to humiliate him, to cause him pain, to torture and kill him. Anyone, this, if I'm going to fast forward to the end here, anyone who calls to mind the atrocities of the early migrations, the invasion by the Huns, or by the so-called Mongols under Genghis Khan or Tamerlane, of the sack of Jerusalem by pious crusaders, even indeed the horrors of the last world war will have to bow his head humble, humbly before the truth of this view of man. Now that the afternoon is ruined, <laughs> so much for love thy neighbor. Um, and, and I thought, you know, when, when, when you look at our, that our, I'm thinking our century, going back to, the, well, for us, what, the 20th century is really our century here for most of us here? Right, yeah. Uh, what has the 20th century been? One of war? Yeah, yeah, somebody's just said afraid so. Afraid so. Uh, but, at, but, when, but when you look at the title of this talk, note the title. Right, Trump's left. Now, the word Trump's has been around for a long time. The Trump card, so on and so forth, right? So long as that's what I mean. I'll leave that up to your conscience. But the fact of the matter is, when you go through this idea of fascism, this is what you've seen. This is exactly what you've seen. The right topping the left. This is a common attribute here. Why? It seems that the left not being quite as organized or not having, let's say, let's say, let's call it like it is, the killer instinct. Lenin sure, certainly had it. <laughs> he had it. Somehow I don't think Bernie Sanders is cut out of the Lenin cloth. I just don't think that's the way. And so when I step back, and, I, and, I've, and I've been in discussions with, with uh, I used to go to the DFA meetings, Democracy for America meetings over at, the, over at the Silver Star Diner once a month. And I remember seeing here 
because this gets us into revolution too. I remember seeing, you know, you go back several years ago, a lot of the people who would go there are old line Democrats, some of them 45 years old on up, and guess who they want? Hillary Clinton here? And I noticed that towards the latter part of 2015 through 2016, there's no longer just 25 people, 30 people going to these meetings. It's now 35, 40, 50, 60. And guess where the age, average age is going? And guess who they want? That's it, Bernie. And I remember after it was all said and done, because I used to go there just to take the temperature and just to watch this, because I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican either. And so after, after the nomination was done and Hillary was given the nomination, she didn't win it, she was given the nomination, and what are these young people saying? This is not over. And when you talk to them, I'm talking about people like 33, 30 and under, right? What are the biggest gripes? Student loan debt? Credit card debt? I got a degree, my job was exported. Now this, this is not fiction. This is what some of them are, are telling us. And they're also saying that the Democrat, what they call the Democratic Party, is not the party of the working man. I don't know where they've been. That's been that way for years. And so, but, and they affixed their wagon to this thing known as our revolution. And I finally had to ask them because to me our revolution is evolution really. Uh, Sanders is not interested in tearing the whole system apart. He's interested in tinkering is what he's interested in doing. That doesn't solve the problem. And so I used to ask these kids, I said, Do you, I, I just, I'm just curious, any of you really know what a real revolution is? Man, I could have heard a pin drop. I said, a real revolution. I said, what Bernie's proposing is not revolution. I said, a real revolution destroys the present system and imparts a new one. That's a real revolution. And I said, go back over history. How about Russia? How about China? How about Vietnam? How about our own revolution? And so, and I said, there's one, there's, I said, there's one commonality here that is with a revolution here, whether it's, whether it's a concerted political action or an armed struggle, the willingness to die. If there's no willingness to die, you're done. It's over. And I said, how many here are willing to die for the change? No one was, <laughs> that, that, you know, was, went by them. I said, then apparently there's something, the difference between some of you and Americans of 1776. Didn't they win that revolution? Did some of them die doing it? Because what does Jefferson write? The tree of liberty is watered with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Well, what does that have to do with this? Uh, well, you know, going back to the 19th century, when these ideas, you know, coming out of the American and French revolutions, the ideas of the age of reason, age of, age of enlightenment put into action, liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism, uh, it, you know, these ideas, you know, there are practitioners of I these ideas trying to take these notions and running with them. Giuseppe Mazzini was one of them, that Italian, that Italian nationalist who wanted to see an organized Italy. And so Italy is, and interesting here too that when the, the, the Congress of Vienna following the, the demise of Napoleon here and the, and, the, and the monarchs are trying to resurrect a new balance of power here. I keep in mind, he destroyed the Holy Roman Empire. How long that been around? Over 900 years. Now there's something of a revolutionary nature. He destroyed the Holy Roman Empire. Wow. That's a change. And then he puts together 16 German states, the, the, the Confederation of the Rhine, as a buffer to Tsarist Russia. Well, what does this do? This begins to make cohesive what? German nationalism, culture, so on and so forth. We're not only separate states anymore. We're now beginning to develop a, a, a unified culture. Well, what do you think some of the people in the Italian boot are doing here when, when, when Napoleon marched in? I mean, for a short period of time, the, the ghettos of the Catholic Church were closed. And these are astounding changes here. And so by 1859, you're seeing, you're seeing on the boot an attempt now to organize this thing known as Italy. You know, you tell some Americans that the United States is older than Italy, and they look at you like you got two heads. They don't get it. They don't know. Is, is the culture older than ours? Yeah. 
Or how about Germany? Germany's fairly new. No, that's not true. Yeah, it is true. You had the smattering of German states, principalities, for centuries. You had that. But a real, what you call modern Germany? No, it's new. It's new. In fact, Germany and Italy are older than Iraq. Tell that to somebody. No, oh, that can't be. Yeah, it can be. Because next month is going to be the 86th, 87th anniversary of Iraq. When in October 3, 1932, uh, the British um, released its mandate and Iraq, the Kingdom of Iraq, became part of the League of Nations. Of course, don't think British sovereignty was over with. Who do you think was controlling the oil here? The Crown. And so, well, Parliament, oil companies, so on and so forth. And so you see these ideas effervescing here, these ide the aforementioned ideas through the 19th century, and even in Italy. And so you begin to see a political change here. And I bring to mind here that the, the principalities here of Piedmont and Sardinia, who wanted a unified state led by the House of Savoy, but a constitutional style of monarchy here. You know, this is becoming prevalent here. I mean, Victoria is already a, a constitutional monarchy. 1830, when Charles X is taken out, the last of the Bourbons, the last absolute in France, and Louis Philippe of the House of Orléans takes over, he's a constitutional monarchy. This seems to be gaining traction here. However, gaining traction, constitutional monarchy, is this one way to preserve royalty here? Because of the face of these changes coming? One could make that argument. And so what do you see with Piedmont Sardinia here? And Austria did not want this, did not want the boot united. Why? Because they always curried influence here. If Italy unites, that's the end of this. In fact, keep in mind, in 1820, when you had the uprising here, the Carbonari in Italy were part of this. Oh, who do you think, who do you think uh, the Vatican was one of those that called in Austrian troops to put this down? And so there are Italians who really weren't fans of Austrians, and rightly so. But this Piedmontese-Sardinian amalgamation here, these people aren't true Democrats constitutional monarchy here. They're not true Democrats. They were not for popular democracy. They were not for mass democracy. Christmas, they sound like some of your founders. It won't work. It won't work. I mean, read Madison. Read, 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 uh, read Hamilton. Your, some of your founders were not fans of democracy at all. A functioning republic where people take part, yes. Mazzini was along the same lines here, but he's not going to get what he wants here. And so when you step back and take a look at the Piedmontese here, ideas of a constitutional monarchy, yet they're against democracy, they are for a restricted clique to run the country. And that gets you to voting rights. Interesting what I found here. The effect of the Piedmontese doctrine restricted suffrage emblematic with the Franchise Law of 1870, which was used to elect the Chamber of Deputies. Property and educational qualifications limited suffrage to just 2% of a population of 26.5 million. Is this real democracy here? Democracy for who? That's the question you've got to ask. Only, get this, only 240,974, or 45.5%, of 230,018 eligible voters participated in the first ballot of the 1870 general elections for the Chamber of Deputies. And of the votes cast, only 177,339 votes were declared valid. That means 7 tenths of 1% chose the representative assembly. Now, the question has to be asked here. Does this retard the development of true democracy in Italy? Yes, it does. It keeps the restricted, it keeps democracy, if you want to use that term, it keeps power to a restricted clique. And that's who? People that own the land, people of privilege, what, hap what happened to the farmer? What happened to this growing working class? What happened to them? 
They don't have a say here? Apparently not. And so when you come back to your own country and take a look at what you call the Democratic Party, if that's what you want to call it, is this the party of the working man? No. Not now. They dumped that and went for that touch of make. They drank the Kool-Aid. Interesting how history repeats. How history repeats. Used to be the party of the working man. Used to be. No longer. No longer. I mean, take a look at where people like Schumer, Pelosi, and people like this get their money from. Not hard to figure this one out. And so, again, Italy is developing here from the get-go as not a true democracy. And so when the people lack a track record of representative government, take a look at Russia. <laughs> Ever since it's been formed, Kiev and Rus in 880, 880 AD, has representative government ever really taken root here? And so with the collapse of the Soviet Union, do you expect democracy in 10, 20 years? Yeah, if you believe in Vladimir Putin. Hardly a man of democratic stature here. That, that, that's, that's another story, too, here with Mr. Putin, him and his corporate state. And so this united, this united Italian boot spawns with a chamber of, Depu chamber of deputies, you know, leaders of these deputies, not, not, King, forget King Victor Emmanuel, the leaders of these deputies, which, which, which they rule the chamber of deputies. Your founding fathers took a look at this at the Constitutional Convention. When they were putting together your system of checks and balances here, First, they had only one house in the legislative branch until somebody, still some people start thinking, well, if you're going to have a chief executive and you're going to have a judiciary and you're going to have a, an ex you're going to have a legislative branch to, as checks and balances, supposing you have a strong-willed individual who takes over the only house in your legislative branch, what do you have now? Two chief executives? How's that going to work? No, I guess we better have a second chamber to the House of to the to the to the to the legislative branch. So you'll have a Senate and a House of Representatives. Why? Because maybe the House of Representatives, who are directly re elected by who? The people, right? Two years. You could do that right from the start. Could also be a check on the Senate. Keep in mind, back then, you didn't vote for your six-year senators. They were appointed for you by your state legislators. You voted for your state legislators. That was a sop to states' rights. See how your founders are thinking here in the beginning? There's checks, this system of checks and balances here. That's not what's going on in Italy. People like uh, Agostino de Pretas, Francesco Crispi, Giovanni Giolitti. These were powerful individuals who took control of the Chamber of Deputies. Who really runs the country? They do, or King Victor Emmanuel? But then again, you're in an era here, the 1870s, 80s, 90s, into the 20th century, where monarchy is losing its grip. It's losing its grip. I went into this this morning when, when I was over at the Latham Center in New Canaan because I'm doing the, the Nazi revolution there. And I was explaining at one point here, um, uh, you know, the run-up to the First World War. After Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Countess Sophie had been assassinated here, uh, how much power do these monarchs have? Uh, people, people like Tsar Nicholas II. Well, maybe he's a poor choice because you know he he didn't like people who were more intelligent than him, which means that only probably left 14 people in Russia. But he's the one who finally acceded in, a, in, a, in an episode of, clerical, of clear thinking here that, yeah, it's a good idea that Russia, England, France, and, and Germany sit down and discuss, discuss this before war breaks out. And he has a letter he wants sent to The Hague. And it winds up on the desk of his foreign minister, Alexei Sazonov, who doesn't send it. It stays on his desk. Because Sazonov really wants war. <laughs> he wasn't the only one. Kaiser Wilhelm II. 
virtually gave the Austrians a green light and the Austrians are going to take it and run with it. And then when it's time to pull them back, it's too late. How much power do these guys really have? They're losing their grip here. And so you begin to see here strong-willed individuals like these Italians I just mentioned, they're helping to pave the way for Mussolini, is what they're doing. Now interesting here too, Germany. A track record of representative government in Germany. That didn't exist. Again, go back to when Bismarck forms this state. The Hohenzollerns. The royal family are up here, but this corporate state is building. And that's what he wanted. A German corporate... He understands the reality coming on here. The German corporate state. Are they going to make some money off of this? Of course they are. They're going to be part of the privileged set. You know, the landed gentry seem to be receding. The bourgeoisie, the factory owner, the industrial capitalist is moving up. Society is changing, not just, not, not, just, not, just, not just the economy and politics, society is changing. Because there's somebody coming in here with the working class, with the, with the peasants, known as the working class. Of course, that brings other things in here, like socialism, unions, trade unions, so on and so forth. That's what makes this fascinating. What a cocktail for problems. And so, but as Bismarck understood, you better give the common man something or else this isn't going to last. So what's that? Unemployment insurance, health insurance, retirement, so on and so forth. Where do you think the Roosevelt administration got this from? When they were putting together the New Deal, they consulted what Bismarck did. Yet, this is still not a functioning system of representative government. Sure, they're electing people to the Reichstag, but who really runs the country? The Hohenzollerns, Kaiser, backed by this growing corporate state. Is this true de de democratic government? No, it's not. Not at all. And so when you see by the time 1916 comes along, and the, and the Kaiser is really benign here anyway, the general staff's been running the war, and so on August 29, 1916, you know, they're going to tell him. You know, uh, the, Willie, this isn't working. Go back to the estate, tend the garden, saw the wood, and we'll handle it from here. Well, they're not going to win the war either. They're going to lose. And so the military dictatorship falls apart. And so when you see this thing known as the Weimar Republic come along, people are electing social democrats. They're electing Catholic Center Party ele uh, 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 deputies. They're electing democrats. Most of the people that are going to be involved in this government, elected officials, by the way, maybe center, just some to the right, but many center left. Yet the government functionaries are different. They had been appointed by the military dictatorship. They had been appointed by the Hohenzollerns. Guess where their alliance is, their allegiance is? It's not to the people. They're, 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 they're committed functionaries here. This is their job. And so when you step back again and take a look at Germany, you know, uh, it's fascinating to see this. It, pay, it does pave the way for the extreme right. You know, between 1918 and 1922, there were 376 political murders in Germany. 356 by the right, 22 by the left. 63 people will be brought before the courts and prosecuted. 11 will be executed. All 11 were from the left. And so you step back and take a look at Hitler, the Munich Putsch. That's a, isn't that an attempted coup here? What do you think he should have got? He gets five, sentenced to five years, serves nine months. Interesting here. Fascinating. Russia. Again, getting back to Russia. And I bring, and I add Russia here because of Joe Stalin, who not only crushes the left, he crushes the right. <laughs> you gotta give Joe, a, a, you gotta give Joe kudos here for this. He's a true Democrat when it comes to that. I don't care who it is. I don't care who it is, but you know, again though, he's building a corp he's building a factory system. You know, not being stupid, he understands here, he understands perfectly well that we can't, you know, that Versailles was the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on modern man. You know, the Tsar mobilizes six million men, but only four million have rifles. 
It's the least organized, least industrialized, least prepared for war. Well, not on my watch. So he's going to collectivize the peasant, pinch their grain and livestock offshore, take in hard currency, and he's going to bring in what? American, British, and French engineers. And interestingly enough, it's going to be the Americans that teach them planned obsolescence. And so by 1941, guess who's really the world's second leading industrial power? The Soviet Union here. Although even Nazi-controlled Europe, they can't outproduce all of Nazi-controlled Europe, but on an individual basis. That's going to help win the war. That's one of the allied keys to victory here. To me, it's a secret key because I don't think many people understand this. Soviet industrial production. People say, what? You've got to be kidding. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But to do this, what did, what did Stalin do? He had a backlash in this party. Urbanized this country, you know, fa put in factories. Lenin really wanted to do that. But in, by, you know, he dies in January 1924. But prior to this, he couldn't do that because he needed the peasant. That's what he needed. He needed the peasant. You know, he nationalizes the banks. He nationalizes big corporations. If you had a small business, though, he let it slide for the most part. But big corporations, big banks, no, we're nationalizing that. He really wanted to nationalize the land, but he couldn't. He couldn't because of his doctrine, the proletarian revolution, the factory worker, only 10, 12% of Russians were factory workers. Well, how is, this Rus how is this revolution supposed to succeed? You made up the peasant with the factory worker. Now he's changing the Marxian doctrine here, just the proletariat. But it works. The Bolsheviks win the revolution. But he wanted to urbanize the country and modernize it. That's where Stalin comes in. And that's exactly what Stalin's going to do. But how is he going to do that? Number one, he's going to have to defeat the left. That amalgamation with Trotsky and Grigory Zinoviev, which he will. Trotsky's going to be given his train tickets out. Zinoviev later on is going to catch a bullet. But then again, to, keep, to, 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 to do this, you know, there are people like Mikhail Tomsky, uh, Nikolai Bukharin, which was re who was really one of the big theorists of the Bolsheviks, if you never heard of him, he's an interesting person to get to know. Nikolai Bukharin. And they're the type, you know, no, no, no this, they believe in that NEP, that new economic program that, that Lenin put up after the Civil War that the peasant can keep the land and sell a lot of the crops they're growing. And he was criticized for that by some members of the Bolshevik party. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not Marxism. No, but if you want to stay in power. So what is, the op what is the object of the exercise? Power. We've come this far. We're not losing it. What happened to, what happened to allegiance to doctrine here? Wow. Interesting here. So Stalin is going to have to crush. He crushes the le left. He will not, uh, not only do that, have to crush the right. Because both Tomsky and Bukharin are eventually going to be purged. And Stalin's going to go through with his version. You know, this idea of socialism in one country is really what? State capitalism. And so when he purges all these old line Bolsheviks, many he came up with. What happened to friendship here? Another one like Mussolini, wedded to power. And he'll purge all these old line Bolsheviks and bring up new people like Alexei Kosygin, remember him? How about Leonid Brezhnev? How about Nikita Khrushchev, his ultimate heir here? Wow. Go back to Italy here. Nationalism is surging in Italy. Well, this is a new country, right? Aren't some people excited? About, weren't Americans excited about a new America here? This, right, this newfound nationalism. You could, you know, you know, you know what I find this astounding here? Iraq. You know, when the British and French drew all those borders in the sand? This is a new country. What Iraq? It doesn't even really exist. It exists in the minds of some people. But now that the British drew these borders, and let's understand why they draw these, draw these borders, because there's oil here. They know there's oil here. There's oil next door in Persia. Got to be oil here. 
And so this newfound nationalism, newfound nationalism between Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds, they come together in 1920 to throw the British out. They fail. They fail. It's interesting, a newfound nationalism. Of course, for the most part, they're all Arabs, aren't they? Sure, let's throw them out. Doesn't work. And so in Italy, you see this rising nationalism. Now, Mussolini here is a socialist. He's to the left. He criticizes Italy for getting into the 1911 1912. Italian-Turkish War, a war nobody remembers now. You know, Italy being one of these young and up-and-coming powers here, or at least they like to think so, wants to get into the colonial game. And what do they want? Tripolitania, which is a province of modern Libya, right? And the British never wanted it. The French never struck out from Morocco or Algeria for it. There's nothing there but sand. There's nothing there. This is pre-oil. There's nothing there. You know, the Brits and the French, you want to go after it, go right ahead. So they do. They get involved in a war with the Turks. The Ottomans are descending anyway, and they're going to win this war. They're going to win this war. But Mussolini was against this as a socialist. And I know I've told some of these people here before, this is the first war, at least from what I can find recorded, that man uses an airplane to bomb his fellow man. It's the first time. Where is that going to go? Where is that going to go? And this is only what? Nine years after the, after the rights fly. Wow. However, just prior to the war, just prior to the war, Italy is in a recession. Red Week in June 1914. Well, June 28, 1914 is the day Archduke Franz Ferdinand and the Countess Sophie are assassinated. And these countries will tumble into war. Italy does not. Interesting. Now, you know, Italy was, was, was allied with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Part of the Triple Alliance. They won't answer that, al that alliance. Why? It's not because these, these Italians were cavalier or had a re or, or going back to what I mentioned in the beginning, love thy neighbor, don't believe that one. They signed a secret treaty with the British and the French. They're going to get territory. The, the British will later, t you know, they back out because they don't want to be involved. They actually can't with the problems internally here. But later they're going to sign that secret treaty with Britain and France. And they're promised a lot of Slav lands across the Adriatic. That's why they join the British and the French. And on top of that, they're going to take part, take part, mind you, in the dismemberment of the Ottoman Empire. I'm talking the Turkish homeland, Anatolia. That's coming down the road. Mussolini beginning to sense where the country is going because ardent nationalists like Giuseppe, like uh, the... Um, um, D'Annunzio, Gabriel D'Annunzio, ardent nationalists, you know, people should answer the call, become part of this ardent nationalism. You know, Italy can get ahead with the war, we have territories to win here. And so Mussolini will move from the left to the right. He'll get his own newspaper, Popolo d'Italia. And he'll be supported by the Italian government, that paper. And you know who else will give him money later on? The French. Because it helps to keep Italy in the war. Mussolini, as being anti-war and changing his tune, will actually become a soldier. He'll be wounded on the Isonzo in 1917. And so he goes back when he's recovering to writing and giving speeches. He's already known in Italy as a very excitable speaker and he writes in a biting style. Writes in a biting style. Now keep in mind in 1918 the expectations of Italy raising its stature on the world stage by grabbing these other territories comes for naught. Again, this ardent nationalism. 
one of the reasons is Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. People will be able to determine their own fate. Well, they're not going to get all those territories in, in Slav lands across the Adriatic. And what's going to happen in Anatolia, the Turkish homeland? Kamal Ataturk's going to put together remnants of, of the Ottoman army. And, th and he's going to, he, you know, this is a Christianization of Anatolia. This is like a modern crusade here. What you're seeing going on here. Many writers don't put it that way. I will. That's what you're seeing here. The Ottoman Empire has collapsed. That leaves a void. You know history. Doesn't somebody always try to fill the void here? Of course they do. But Kamal Ataturk will lead this army and lead this fight. It's called the 1919-1922 Russo, the, the Turkish War for Independence. And they're going to kick out the Greeks, the Italians, the British, and the French. There will be no Armenia, and there's going to be no Kurdistan either. And modern Turkey is the way you see it. Because of that war and the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, the, the, the borders will be solidified. By that I mean Turkey, Iraq, Syria, so on and so forth. And so there's disappointment in Italy. And so by 1919, you know, the, the economy is going downhill. And by 1919, 1920, there's two million Italians out of work. Now, this is a vast disappointment with this ardent nationalism. Italy's raising itself on the world stage. We're going to grab new territory. It's not working. It's not working. Interestingly enough, trade unions, right? This happened in 1914. Where in 1914, Red Week, you know, there's always that fear of, the Bolsh of Bolshevism here or communism spreading its way west. This is in particular, this in Italy, this is particularly held by businessmen, bankers, the army, and the Vatican. The Vatican is a reactionary institution here. In fact, in 1914, some of these workers and peasants began to <laughs> be, began to take army generals captive and began to pro proclaim in their in their little enclaves in their little towns independent republics interesting here in the small towns these unions were more successful in organizing people than in the cities because in the cities keep in mind in 1914 uh, the trade union leaders were afraid what was going to happen here, and they began to call an end to the strikes. And so when the cities were, when the, when the, the, the strikes occurred, uh, came to a conclusion in the cities, what do you think eventually happens in the countryside? And so the so-called left shot themselves in the foot here. And you see here, in 1919, 1920, 1921, in Italy, the socialists are split. There are people called the maximalists. They want all the marbles. You have, a, you have another branch of this part, of, the, of, the, of these people, the socialists, who want a go slower approach. They don't want to tear the country apart. In, guess who steps into the, the fill this void of discontent here? The right. Mussolini, by 1920, has already organized the fascist, the fascist combat squads, which is a forerunner of what you're going to see Hitler do with his SA, the Sturmabteilung, the stormtroopers. And interestingly enough, again, the reactionary institutions here, the Vatican, the army, businessmen, bankers, see in Mussolini as perhaps, especially his fascist combat squads, as an adjunct to the organs of security. Even the Vatican is moving towards, is moving towards Italy, the fascists being a sobering effect here. Sobering effect. Why? Because they're afraid of socialism and they're afraid of Bolshevism. God forbid the worker has a right here. 
And so, Mussolini, and so his fascist combat squads begin to take it to the, co uh, to the socialists and their supporters, the workers, and so on and so forth in the countryside. Homes are burned, people are beaten up, sometimes killed. You saw the same thing in Germany later on. That's what you're going to see in Germany with the Fry Corps, beginning with the Fry Corps, even before the Sturm ab Tielung. And so Mussolini is becoming more acceptable to these reactionary institutions to the extent that by 1922 he's going to bring his fascist movement on board and he's going to take power in October 1922. Why? Because he is seen as a, as a sobering effect on the socialists and on the communists. Keep in mind, Italy is going to eventually have a sizable communist party. Fascinating from the perspective, guess who, guess who are those who kill Mussolini in 45? The communists. The communists. You know, he had a daughter. She was a, I don't know how many people are familiar with Mussolini's family. He had a daughter. She was a beautiful girl. She later took her place in the Italian parliament, years, years after the war. Years after the war. So the effect of Mussolini was still around. But, the, but that march by his fascist followers on Rome, I mean, they made a big deal of this. Mussolini leading his black shirts into Rome. He only marched two miles. He took the train a lot of the, most of the way here. That was another thing, you know, in 1934, I think it was, when Hitler made his, I think it was his first state visit to Italy, and in the fascist partnership, Mussolini is really the senior partner here. He'd been in power longer, and, and Hitler shows up in the state visit, and you know, they're on, that, they're on that portico there that Mussolini used to speak from in Rome, you know, the big chin and the tassel and the off the fez and so on and so forth. And he's in that military uniform, the nice black boots, you know, pristine here. And here's Hitler. He, he's, he's in this double-breasted, a rumpled double-breasted suit. He, looked, he had the caricature of Peter Lorre. And Mussolini, this big military parade, this goes on for like two hours. This military parade, you know, to show Italy's might. Even in 1934, Italy only had one fully equipped infantry division. And that's the same outfit he marched around six blocks for two hours. Doesn't take much to figure out why in a, just a few years Mussolini is going to be the minor partner here. I don't think that would have happened in Nazi Germany. Uh, but interesting here. But he got power by what? Beating the left. Hitler. You go back to Hitler. Again, I mentioned earlier that the, the, the seeds really here for the, for the victory of the right are just after the war. Go back to what I mentioned about the political murders. Go back to what I mentioned at the failed Munich Putsch. Where Hitler, at five years he's sentenced, he serves nine months. And he's out. And yet, Germany, it seems, after 1923-24, when the Charles, when the General Dawes plan of getting Germany out of the economic morass here, part of that was to get the British and the French and the Belgians to pay us back the war debt. So we're gonna, so we're gonna uh, invest in the German economy, and the Germans will pay back. You know, the 33 billion they owed, they owed the Allies. Well, they pay back the Allies. The Allies pay us back. We take some of that money, pour it back into Germany. The Germans pay back the Brits, the French, the Belgians. They, we, they pay us. We take some of that. You see what's going on here? The dollar's doing this. It's riding the, it's riding the rat wheel here. But it's working, Germans are going back to work. What do I need the communists and the Nazis for? Yet with the depression, what happens? Yet, without this track record of representative government, they are not able to weather this depression. When people have to eat, they have to eat. The trade union movement, again like in Italy, is fractured here. And like Mussolini, like Mussolini, Hitler, his support was really in the small towns, the farmer or the peasant, small businessmen, small landlords, small landowners. Hitler was not as popular in the cities. That's going to come. 
just like Mussolini. Mussolini at first was popular with some of the farmers in the small towns, in the, the small landlords, the small landowners. Then the businessmen will follow. Then the bankers will follow. Then the Vatican will follow. Then the, then the army will follow. Why? Because he looks, as a, he looks like a sobering influence on, on, on stopping the socialists and the Marxists. Well, how do you think Hitler's going to be looked on here? The same way. Because as the, depression, as the depression reaches its height, keep in mind by 1933, one of every three German workers are on the street. America can't save Germany. It can't even save itself. That same year, one of every four American workers is on the street. That's what Roosevelt's going to be saddled with. And so, you know, three governments, Heinrich Brunings government and the other two governments that follow, and the last one, Kurt von Schleicher, General Schleicher, who tried splitting the Nazi ranks, he was more interested in doing that than, than, than solving Germany's economic problems. It fails. You know, Hindenburg is urged here. Hindenburg is urged here by the army, the businessmen and the bankers. You better call that man here, the man you don't want, to take control. And who's that? Adolf Hitler. June 30, 1933. And like Mussolini, you know, Mussolini was smart in 1919. He didn't do as well in the election, so he couldn't get power then. But he eschewed the idea of working with it, going, by the way, a coup d'etat. He was smart. Well, so was Hitler. Hitler learned from Munich. I'll be given power. I'll take power legally. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Circumstances dictate that's exactly what's going to happen. You honestly think businessmen, bankers, the army want to install a communist? No. We'll bring Hitler on board. We'll pick his government for him, which is what they're going to do. And we are hiring him. Well, history shows how that worked out. But he will make sure, and he's going he's to you know, he's gonna push the agenda with the Reichstag fire. Because now he's going to be given, he's going to be given, you know, by Hindenburg, almost carte blanche on ca cracking down on the communists. And the roundups begin, and the concentration camps begin to open up. And then he's able to get through, he's able to get through the Reichstag in July 1933, the outlawing of every other political party in Germany except for one. And guess who that was? The Nazis. He's got power. Interesting here in Germany, among there was a fracture, there was a fracture between the socialists in Italy. The maximalists who wanted total power really and the, and the, other, and the other side of, side of the socialist party were looking at that go slow approach. In Germany what did you have? You had the communists and the Social Democrats, who were centered to the left. Their antecedents really were Marxist. But with the Social Democrats in power in 1919, you had the Spartacus League try to, try to, try to foment a, a German revolution here in, in Berlin in January 1919. The Spartacus League, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. And guess what? The Social Democrats want this put down. It's an attempted coup. You know what they wanted? You know what the Spartacus League wanted to do? Proclaim a German, a Soviet Germany. Again, Western Europeans fearing Bolshevism leeching its way west. Well, what's the Social Democratic Party going to do? They're going to call on the army to crack down on it, but the army brings in the Fry Corps, those paramilitaries of unemployed factory workers and out of uniform soldiers. And if this was so-called republic, Liebknecht and, Rosa and Luxembourg should have been arrested, right, and tried? No, they're not. They're going to be brutally murdered in the working class section of Berlin. Again, even though the Social Democrats are center to the left, what do they do? They go to the right. Wow. Again, long term, does this make it easier for somebody like Hitler to take power? Yes. Because that's what's going to happen here. That's what's going to happen here. The Soviet Union I did. What about the United States? What about the US? How about that? You remember in the 1930s, right? The New Deal. 
Get us out of the depression. All those alphabet super programs like CCC, WPA, NRA. Yeah, what gets, out, gets us out of the depression in the end? The war. War production. That's hardly socialistic here, is it? That's hardly what that is. Because here you are seeing, like you saw in First World War, the beginning of this, you are now seeing it's accentuated here, the beginning of big business and big government coming together to fight an industrialized war. But Roosevelt understood here, Roosevelt understood, and he got enough of his class involved here, that you're going to have to give me money to resurrect this economy. I'm talking about the rich. Because he's also being pushed by who? Workers? That's when unions had some teeth. And who was involved in the union movement to an extent? Socialists and communists. Communists in this country helped build the middle class for crying out loud. That's not, that's not what they can say in Russia. Interesting what you see develop here. Yet, yet, as the years roll on here, what happened to socialists and communists? You remember the uh, Joe McCarthy hearings? Remember that? That's what that was for. Well, you know, it wasn't who lost China. We know who lost China. Chiang Kai-shek lost China. Truman didn't lose China. Roosevelt didn't lose China. Chiang Kai-shek lost China. A man who at one point was getting hope from, Tsar, from Bolshevik Russia, then Nazi Germany, and then from us. Boy, we sure know how to pick them. In fact, keep in mind, I find this interesting. It's the United States and Soviet Union that do win the war in 45, and yet you get 1950, the McCarthy era, to purge this nation of communists and socialists. That's what this is for. If you remember the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, under God is added. I mean, come on here. That's, 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 that's against communism. That's what that's for. That's all it means. And yet, in 1946, Stalin beats us to the punch. Andrzej Danov will do the same thing we are going to do with the McCarthy hearings. People, this is now the war is over with. We are no longer part of that grand alliance. Stalin now has really pure, unadulterated power. All journalists, teachers, actors, playwrights, whatever the case may be, is not on board with the post-war agenda, they're purged. <laughs> the two powers that win the war do the same thing here. Power is what matters, not with, not with <laughs> the people here. The power, the power is what matters. Yet, interestingly enough, you know, with this country here, you know, the, which I find tragic in a way, our, our youngsters who were born like in 1997 on, all they know is war here. That's all they know. War. How's that working out for them? We've won any of those wars since they've been born? <laughs> no, all they know is defeat. Yet if you look at it, the country's been on a war footing on and off since December 7, 1941. That's a long time. That's a long time. Has that eviscerated your domestic politics? You better believe it has. I remember doing some research on World War I. For the short time we are in that war, it cost us $2 million an hour. I was doing research up in Army Aviation Magazine on Vietnam because of the helicopter, and I found out that between 1968-69, that war is costing us $14 million an hour, and it's a loser. But, you know, General Dynamics made money, uh, you know, uh, Sikorsky made money, and that's what's going on now, right? And so this, this move toward war has done what? It's just helped destroy your system of representative government. Well, because look what happened in the 60s. Again, the rise of the left. The civil rights movement, remember that. How about the anti-war movement? Remember that one. The baby boomers, right, are out in the street, right? What has happened to baby boomers since the 60s? They've gone from Woodstock to Bankstock. What they did. And so another aspect here, and this to me is a big one, and this isn't really talked about, and I think it should be. 
in the some of you might have might, some of you might remember in college, depending on what school you went to, weren't there some of your some of your friends questioning capitalism? Weren't there some of the academics questioning capitalism? God forbid you right, you question America's state religion. God forbid. It's not Christianity. It's capitalism is America's state religion here. And so in August 1971, a man who will be nominated to the Supreme Court, his name is Lewis Powell, Jr., writes a letter. It's a long one, 34 pages. It's really a, mis it's really a, a memo here. I call it the memo, the, the memo for American Fascism about what business should do to blunt the so-called left. Business. They need to organize to the extent, and this is addressed by the way to Eugene P. Sidnor, the education chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. And he said business needs to take its place in the education system. Business needs to take its place in our political structure. Business needs to, and he says to do this, businesses must each, especially large businesses, must create a special vice president who's in charge, virtually of propaganda here. And through the Chamber of Commerce, hire a stable of speakers who will put, who put a fond message on free market, business, and so on and so forth, related topics. And they should go to the school, not only colleges, guess where else? High schools. And we already have a ready-made system to propagate this doctrine. Because doesn't every major city in this country have a Chamber of Commerce office? Don't all major, all, all, most towns have a Chamber of Commerce? Even some, even some villages, right? Might be only one or two people, but don't they have a Chamber of Commerce? That's what Lewis Paul sees, and he vilifies one, well, he vilifies a couple of people, but one man in particular with this missive, Ralph Nader. And so you begin to see here, following the Lewis Paul memo, uh, contributions to Democrats and Republicans from business and business affiliated followers going where? And what's happening to union contributions over a long period of time? And then you begin to see other things arise. Paul Wolfowitz and his doctrine of preemptive war. The 1997 plan for the new American century by the neocons. Their military plan in 2000. And after 9-11, the Patriot Act. Followed by the 2002 National Security Strategy. Followed by Citizens United. What happened to representative government here? And so by the time you get after 2010, wasn't Obama elected in 2008? What did you see come up? The Tea Party, right? Because I remember as a young Republican, I used to be, I used to be a, a William F. Buckley Republican. And I liked William F. I, I, I liked those intellectuals like Buckley, Gore Dahl, James Ball. I found a, a video here in 1965. It's terrific debate in London between William F. Buckley and James Baldwin. It was about an hour and a half. What a debate. They came out, they shook hands, debated, left, shook hands, and left arm in arm after the, after the debate. I don't think you're seeing that with people like Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. Christmas. So what happened to the intellectual content here? But I remember as a young Republican watching here in the 80s during the Reagan years that the party began to admit people like who were from, who were, I will call them, racist, ultra-nationalist, and people I used to characterize as questionable religious character. This wasn't the Republican Party of my mother and father after this. And so by 2008 or so, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm out of here. I, I found my letter I wrote to the Karen Doyle Lyons, the Registrar of Voters in Norwalk, a Republican Registrar of Voters. I mean, I virtually ripped the Republicans another navel here in two pages. I said, this is, this is the Republican Party? 
So how do you spell it? F-A-S-C-I-S-T? But you can see things change. Even the Tea Party, which was a reaction to what? Part of that's a reaction to the Obama administration. But even they weren't reactionary enough or radical enough. Because what, did, what else did you see begin to come up here? You can see the hate groups coming up here. In 2000, there were 602 such groups. Now there's 1,020. And so you begin to see here in 2016, because you don't have a functioning left anymore. Where's Kennedy? Where's McGovern? What happened to Frank Church? What happened to Feingold? He got purged. How about Dennis Kucinich? He got gerrymandered out. I always found it fascinating because as a young Republic, as, as a Republican, the last person I voted in the last, the last um, primary I had in the state, I voted for Ron Paul. And the reason I voted for Ron Paul is because he's saying the wars are illegal. We're going broke fighting them. And I found it interesting that here's a guy who professes this libertarian, really conservative agenda. At the same time, Dennis Kucinich from the other side is saying the exact same thing. And I don't think it's an accident. Neither, can run, neither are running anymore. And so you begin to see really where you're going in 2016. Because now, just like I had done earlier, you're beginning to see people, they're eschewing establishment Democrats and establishment Republicans. That's what they're doing here. Hence Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I find this absolutely fascinating here. Because Sanders was favored by who? The younger set, now, now, keep in mind here, there are, I know some people post uh, up north of 80 who voted for Sanders. But representative, who's really mostly voting for Sanders? The younger set, right? So a lot of them are. And so when he does not get the nomination, they gave, the Democrats gave the nomination to the person they coronated years before, Hillary Clinton, because if not, the donors are going to dry up. That's what Hillary represents, the donors. They're going with her rain or shine. It doesn't work that way with Republicans because guess who's going to win the nomination there? Mr. Trump. Why? Because you have people like Jeb Bush who are clueless of, this, of what's going on here. They really are. Conventional establishment Republicans. And so Trump wins the nomination. He was smart enough to go from the right to the left. Why? He appealed to people, some of these people, of course he got some of the rich vote. That's, that's a given. But people who would have voted for, for Sanders, now that, now that Hillary won the nomination, guess where they're going? To the right. Trump appeals to them. He's smart, he's clever. He might be a constitutional illiterate, but he's smart enough to know, he's smart enough to know how to manipulate the system. You got to give him that. You can criticize him all you want, some people here can, but you got to give him that. Some of these people are what? Middle class white men whose jobs went where? Mm-hmm. Middle class, middle class, or what decline, I mean the middle class is declining in this country. 40, 45 years ago, 61% of Americans were middle class, now it's 50. And as more people drop from the middle into that working class and even the poor, where do you think, what do you think is going to happen to the country here? That's what you're seeing here. And so he's able to, he is able to do, he's smart enough to do this. This is why I say right trumps left. You've got to give credit where credit's due here. And so that helps to accentuate that divide between the middle of the country, red states versus the, the so-called elitists on the coast, the blue states. And so is the country fractured? Yeah, it's not like George Washington said, well, north, south, east, west, we all have our talents, let's use them all together, let's, let's get together, use our talents to make the country better. That's George Washington. You see that happening now? You see that happening now? And so even though Trump loses the popular vote, 
by what? Just under 3 million, 2.9 and change. He won the Electoral College, which Democrats now are not happy with the Electoral College. Gee, that's tough. If you ran somebody worthwhile, you would have won. Just like in 2000, apparently Al Gore wasn't good enough. And they'll blame Ralph Nader for that. Don't blame Ralph Nader. If you run somebody good, you will win. End of discussion here. All this fuss and, fuss and feathers over the, over the Electoral College. Sour grapes. Sour grapes. Interesting. Whether we keep it or not, really, because I, I, I was in those forum pan debates when I got picked by the League of Women Voters for this and the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact people. And that was two years ago. And we had these at the Westport Playhouse and then down at the Greenwich Library. They had it in their auditorium there. And there were 180 or 200 people a pop at these things. And I mentioned, I said, I'm not overly wedded to the Electoral College as long as we change it via the Constitution. This notion of getting the 270 electoral votes and then bypassing the system, uh, that don't float my boat. You want to get rid of it, you go through your Constitution. That's rule of law. And I said, besides that, if you go to Article 1, Section 10 of the United States Constitution, it says interstate compacts are illegal unless, unless okayed by Congress. It's black and white. How hard is this to figure out here? Well, no, because who, who controls the Senate? Republicans, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, politics comes into this. But at the same time here, when you go back and you take a look at that, 200 and two, that 2016 election, you know, there were 231 million and change voters in this country, people eligible to vote. 231 million and change. And who showed up? 136,700,000 and change. That's 53.3% of Americans eligible to vote show up. 46.7% stayed home. And out of that 136,700,000 and change who did vote, 128,000,000 and change voted for either Hillary or Trump. Two people who had no intention at all, have or had, of abiding by the Constitution and Bill of Rights. What does that say about the voters? They've been channeled into voting for Democrats and Republicans so long, and I've been hearing this since Nixon. Well, it's the lesser of two evils. Well, going by that premise, either way results in what? Evil here? One lesser than the other, perhaps. Uh, you know, it, 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 they've been channeled. and they. However, it seems the young now, some of the younger set, this is where you're beginning to see now maybe a rise of the left. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez be being representative of this perhaps. This younger set. You know, when Pelosi was first, you know, when Pelosi was Speaker of the House, I, I thought that she, uh, unlike Hillary, had that political savvy and chutzpah to, you know, offset Trump here. But she's got a problem in her, own, in her own denomination here. This young crop of people who were voted in their districts, who are fed up with the establishment. You see what's happening here? It, change takes a long time. It doesn't happen overnight. And so you are, gonna, you are seeing here a rise of the left. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm going to tell you something. Back in 2017, there was a poll taken in this country of people under 30 years old. No, there was another poll taken in Jan 2000, 2000, January 2016 of poll people under 30 years old. And 43% said they were practitioners of, have an affinity for, or want to know more about socialism. In 2017, a poll was taken. 36% of Americans in this poll said they were conservative. 9% said they were liberal. That same poll was taken this, earlier this year. 35, 36% conservative, 26% liberal. These are long-term changes here. And the Census Department between 2016 and 2000, 2020, when this is over with, you're going to see 16 million new eligible voters. What age group is that? Yet at the same time, 10 million older voters are going to be going where? Out. Dying, you know, whatever, can't, aren't going to be voting anymore. 
But that's, so how is this going to look by 2024, 2028? That's how you have to look at this. Where is the country going here? Because believe it or not, folks, imperialism is the end game of American capitalism. We can't keep spending this mo on these monies, the, all these monies on these wars. 54 cents of every dollar of discretionary spending gets what it's going for. War. We're a war capitalist country. That's what we are. You think the young likes this? Not on your life. Not on your life. And besides, uh, you know, uh, this stuff about, you know, um, with this latest incident here with Saudi Arabia, you really think there's going to be a war here? How many Americans want to go to the Euphrates River or wherever it is to fight? Not many Americans, most Americans don't want to fight anymore. This is not December 8, 1941. Those days are over. Interesting here, interesting here how war affects your politics. Go back to Italy, 1914. Go back to Germany, 1914. Go back to Russia, 1914. Then come to us, 1973, you know, what happened in 2001, and what's happening now in Afghanistan, God bless you. You really think you're going to win in Afghanistan here? 58% of guys, who, guys and gals who have been there in a uniform say the war isn't worth fighting. I'm talking the rifle toters, not not some general who's working for Raytheon who wants to sell cruise missiles. I'm not talking about them. And so interesting here, interesting here where your country is going. My wife says, boy, this is frightening. I said, are you kidding? This is exciting. Yeah, for you it is because you're a historian. You, you said, yeah, it's fascinating. Even if it's your own country, it's fascinating to see. It truly is. It truly is. And so she'll say, well, you have no faith. I said, don't say that. I says, look at where the young people are going here. They want this country for themselves. How what they make of it for themselves is something else. And so when I ever confront them, I said, keep in mind, you can flirt with socialism or movements like this, but remember one thing. You need to go back to your Constitution and Bill of Rights before you're ready to change this country. That was your blueprint for government, and we've gone off it. And that irks me that we've done that. It really has. Is, are there imperfections here? Of course there is. It's done by man. Of course there's imperfections here. Like the three-fifths compromise, I know it's still there. They had the amendment against slavery, but should, you know, should we have a constitutional convention to take things like that out? Yeah, sure, why not? Why not? Um, and really give co a Congress the power of the purse. Instead of having the Defense Department have power of the purse. Because working on the fringe of it, that's how I see it. That's how I see it. Any organization that has $2.7 trillion in assets and can't account spending over 20 years for $21 trillion, who has the power here? They do? or the people you elected? That's a question I know Himes isn't going to ask, and I know Murphy isn't going to ask, and I know Bloom, forget Blumenthal, he's not going to ask that question. And even if they were Republicans, they're still not going to ask that question. That crosses party lines and gender lines, so on and so forth. If you're in that city down there, yeah, okay, to me that's the off-ramp on 95 between Sodom and Gomorrah. They can't properly account for spending it. Uh, well, it depends on, on, on the deficit. I mean, I've heard 21 trillion, 23 trillion, whatever the case may be. I step back and look at it. That 21 trillion dollars is 600 billion more than our gross national product. So was Ron, was Ron Paul onto something here? I mean, he may, I remember him at a news conference. He goes, because someone asked him about the money. He goes, let me get this straight. We borrow 15 billion from China and plow it into Afghanistan. Then he asked the question, how's that worked? <laughs> and I remember my son. I asked my son when, when Eric was in his second combat tour in Iraq. He was in Ramadi, 2008. And they went on a mission in Ramadi. 
and they had a truck with all these shrink wrap bundles and they had to go to a meeting place and all these bundles are unloaded put inside this building on a long table and there's all these shakes and this bundle went to this shake this big bundle went to this shake this it's money they're paying off the awakening groups not to shoot at the kids is what they're doing and they were paying each of the awakening soldiers ten bucks a day I guess that's one way of arranging foreign policy so these kids don't come back in a coffin and my son you know because they were ordered keep your mouth shut uh, you know he doesn't really say anything until he gets home and I remember my son telling me he says boy there's too bad there wasn't any like 10 12 American taxpayers here to watch this I said Eric if that ever happened they never would have got out of Iraq alive but then he made the comment I had to go to the poorest city in the world to see the most American money I'm ever going to see in one setting. Out of, the mouth of, out of the mouths of babes, right? And then you wonder why some of these kids get turned off. You don't see any peace treaties today, no ceasefires, nothing like that. Those days are gone. And so when the war is over with, well, what are we doing now? We just leave enough loose ends for the next one? Now what happened to this? There's no, there's, no, there's no semblance of finality here. There really isn't. You're too much into gray. There's no black and white. There's no right or left. Everything's obscured here. Everything's cloudy. That kind of thing. And, and it's, is it disconcerting to the American public? Yeah, it sure is. Is it disconcerting sometimes to some of these rifle toters? Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. Yes, Keith? Well, you, you saw... You saw, well, eh, could that happen? It's not impossible. But then again, it might happen down the road, not with Trump either. You know, and I always tell people, well, well who are you going to vote for, Hillary? I said, no, I want to vote for her for. I said, but whether you got Hillary or not, you were going to wind up with somebody like a Trump anyway. The, the, because we don't have a functioning system of representative government. We don't have one. So some, something, someone or something's going to fill that void. And so when you take a look at that, at that situation, take a look at what happened in Charlottesville. There's an example. And then, and then when you see some of these, uh, some of these uh, rallies, uh, these Trump rallies, they look like mini Munichs, for crying out loud. You know, you didn't have this years ago. You didn't have this when someone's running for president when he's causing a disturbance, beat him up and throw him out. When did presidential candidates say that? They do now, apparently. And so where has the dialogue, the dialogue itself, what happened to dialogue here? And so I know uh, I'm having a brand new website built. It's being built right now. And it's going to be, and I got the title of it from Noah Webster. Because I'd like to see the country return to something like this. When in 1787, he was a teacher in Philadelphia at this point. And he knew a lot of the founders. He knew what was going on at that Constitutional Convention. In fact, he took part in the dialogue going on here. Many of your founders were not only hashing this out in Independence Hall. <laughs> After they leave, they go back and they're, they're writing up a storm and sending it to these newspapers, magazines, almanacs, whatever the case may be, that existed then. And they're carrying on the discussion outside Independence Hall. This was big then. I mean really big. And Noah Webster said that what the founders are putting together is really not a country. It's an empire of reason. Get a load of that one. Who writes like that anymore? And if they did, would half the American public get it? That's the question you have to ask. Back then a lot of people got it. And so interesting here Interest, that's what I would like to say. Have a, more intellect, have a more intelligent discussion of our problems instead of seeing another Charlottesville. Beg your pardon? She says you've got to have intelligent people to do it. They exist. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I, somebody just said lazy. You know, I mean, out of, out of 300, this country's better than this. I, I, I think this country's better than this. 335 million people, and we wind up with Hillary and Trump running for office here? You've got to be kidding me. That's how bad we are? That's horrible. 
But then again, you step back and you th and my wife and I were talking about this the other night, and she hate she she's not a real she's not a Trump fan at all, and she's not a, wasn't a big Hillary fan either. And I said, well, I said let's understand something about today's America. They come from us. Yeah, I do, I do, I do because of the fact these people. What else do they have? Right. Although you still have some sort of a social safety net, you didn't have that in the early 30s. And so were those people back in the early 30s more galvanized? And keep in mind, the state response was rougher than it is now, at least so far. And so you began, you saw, you, I mean, you saw these big companies hiring what, Pinkerton guards, bringing in the National Guard. I mean, these people had a fight for it, and I mean fight for it. But, that, but now, but now the country being the way it is, and let's understand something else here too that didn't help the American worker. Of course, we didn't acclimate to the situation, globalization. And so when you take a look at 1945, when America is the only game in town, economically, politically, socially, militarily, we're the only game in town. Those were the days, I'm sure some of you folks remember that. You went to work for some company, you worked for 30, 35 years, you retired, you got a pretty good pension, huh? What happened with that one? Did globalization adversely impact that? Yeah, because what are some businesses going to do? They're going to go overseas and send jobs because, because they can pay Hop Singh a dollar an hour instead of paying you $25 an hour. That's the reality. Oklahoma they struck, right. California, somebody just said California, right. Right. Well, yeah, California sometimes. California sometimes is like Vermont. Their politics are a little different sometimes. Well, were, were, many, were any of those uh, big bankers that got us into that situation in 2008 ever prosecuted? Uh, one, one guy was, his name is Bernie Madoff, but he was stealing from the rich. But bouncing off what the both of you are saying here, if Hillary had won that election in 2016, everybody would have relaxed. I think so. And, the, and, the, and, and what you're seeing now would have come a few years down the road. Well, they want the donors. That's like, that's like in 2000, December 2017, when that tax plan that Trump got for, the, got, got for America's royalty in the end, uh, at one point it looked a little doubtful, and what did Lindsey Graham say? If we don't get this done, our donors are going to dry up. Well, one, th one, thing, one thing needs to be understood here, and I think, I think this is an issue, and this might, this might happen, that once most, American, most Americans uh, you, at least 95% of them, no matter their color, their gender, their age, are what? Workers. No matter if you're in the Midwest, the North, the South, whatever, you're workers. Is that, is that a, perhaps a rallying point of commonality here? Yes. It's, it's not ready yet. Yes. Well, that's where we're going next week, with that talk, Minions of Malice. But bouncing off what you're saying, Jack, is do some, and, and I'm not asking you to feel sorry for them. I'm not asking you to do that. But do some of these people maybe feel ostracized from their government? Do some of them feel ostracized from the economy? Do some of, do some of them feel ostracized from society? The answer is yes. Did you see that in 1919 Germany? Yes. Did you see that in Italy? Yes. There's a commonality here. When people feel ostracized from the group, uh, how do you think they're going to feel? Well, it depends. It depends how you're. It depends how you're defining mental illness, too. I mean, is it really what's what's considered uh, um, mental illness by 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 medicine? No. So most of the so most of the people that do this uh, are they. Have been, I wouldn't call them. I wouldn't call a lot of them mentally ill. I call them ostracized from society, or 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 government, or 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 their or their, or their political structure. And because because yes, are some of them uh, two sheets to the wind? Yeah, perhaps. But at the same time, here, uh, I don't see I don't see a lot of people who are mentally ill doing this. What I see, what I see, I remember back in the early '60s on Howard Avenue in East Norwalk. 
the typical world post-World War II middle class neighborhood. Half the neighborhood, the houses had a gun, yet no one, no one set up a beachhead on our front lawn, no one stuck up the corner store, and no one shot up the local schoolyard. What has changed from 1961, 64, 65 to now? That's the question I would ask. However, having said that, we live in a different era where the NRA, and I used to be a member of that organization, is not really protecting the Second Amendment. That's a front organization for the gun companies, like the Chamber of Commerce is a front organization for big banks and big corporations. You've seen a change in not only your society, but government and your economy. And so when you take a look, when you take a look at this assault weapons, uh, the assault weapons, those weapons are used for what? Mainly for war? I, you know, as a shooter, I used to get asked, well, Mark, I'm going to buy a gun to protect my house. All right, well, what are you looking at? Uh, first of all, were you ever in the Army or Marine Corps? No, I never was. Were you ever a policeman? No. I said, were you a guard at one of the prisons? No. Uh, every occasionally some people would say yes, but for the most part, no. I said, well, what are you looking at? Well, you know, I want a 357 Magnum. I want a 44 Magnum. I said, well, why don't you buy a 22 first? Buy an inexpensive 22 revolver. Revolvers are easier than semi-auto pistols. Buy a 22. The ammunition's cheap. Try shooting. If you don't like it, sell it and buy a dog. <laughs> I said, and besides, if you point a 22 at somebody, you might think that's a little barrel, but it's still like looking down a manhole. It is. And so, so you're not putting out a lot of money here. It's, to me, a thoughtful way of going about this process. Learn about firearms before you buy one. Uh, to me, this, is, this isn't hard to figure out. This isn't hard to figure out. To me, that's being responsible. But how many, but I know, and most of the people I know who shoot that I used to compete with are very intelligent and very responsible on how they put away their guns. Almost to a man and a woman. I used to shoot against women. And they were good shots. But, um, but they, they were very, very responsible. Of course, you know, we're, we're in a controlled environment here too, I'll give you that. And most of those people I shot with never really carried a gun. And this is handgun shooting. This isn't rifle, this is handgun shooting. Well, it, again, again, you're talking about a country, this country, that was founded on the firearm. It was. And so it's hard to break old habits. Now, granted, I'll give you that that was back in the day with muskets. I'll give you that. They didn't have AK-47s and AR-15s. I'll give you that one, too. Uh, however, having said that, and I'll tell you, I had a friend of mine who used to collect firearms. And he had a Thompson submachine gun from 1928. He bought it as a collector. And he said, you want to shoot it? I said, yeah. And it had the round, you know, the old untouchables type with the round drum. And, and I started shooting this thing. And yeah, it, you do. When I started shooting it, you know, it, it pulled up. So I did the old Robert Stack. You know, Robert Stack used to be a crack shot. Remember when he was on the Untouchables? He was a crack shot. He held the record in California for uh, skeet shooting. He hit 317 of those things in a row before he missed. That was a record for 17 or 19 years. And he was a good shot with a handgun. But if you ever noticed, whenever he fired that old Thompson, he would lean over. So instead of it pulling up, it did this. So I did that. It worked. <laughs> it worked. And so I gave it back to him. I said, yeah, you know, I did it once. OK, fine. I'm not going to go out and buy one. But being a historian, you know, uh, going back to like World War II arms, I got a chance to fire a weapon that was in my father's era, which was, I'll, I won't deny it, it was fun to do. So the beer can set up. Uh, but, but then I did it once. Done. You know, I'm not going to go out and buy one. But I, I don't, I just, I, you know, I used to tell people, try buying a 22. Do this thing sensibly. If you don't like it, you haven't come out of pocket with a lot of money. It's not hard. I forget Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry. It's not, everybody is not this way. You can't do this. It's not hard to figure this out. But again, is, is this, you know, are, 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 are the origins of this nation? Yeah, it was founded on the firearm. You needed a firearm. You needed it. You absolutely had to have one. But is it, I mean, I know since I've owned a gun, do I, do I carry a gun? I've never carried a gun. I never have. 
The only reason I got my permit was to go from the house to the range and back again. Otherwise, I never would have got a permit. But the state law requires, so I followed the state law. It's not hard here. It's not hard. Well, you know, if, if you're on a farm and you, you have a, you know, and the, and the soldiers aren't that close by and you might have an Indian problem, and you're going to beg, borrow, and steal to get that gun. And so, but at the same time here, when you go back to the, somebody mentioned the Second Amendment earlier. Uh, yeah, the Second Amendment, but when the country was founded, it was bolstered by the 1792 Militia Act because your founders did not want a large standing army. They thought it was a threat to the Grand Republic. So every state, every state, every white male, 18 to 45, had to have a gun. And, you, and to be in the militia, Washington didn't buy your gun. Guess who, bought, guess who bought you your gun? You did. You bought your own gun, your own powder, your own ball, your own shirt, your own pants, your own shoes, your own coonskin cap if you wanted that. But the governors controlled these militias. This was a way of disseminating American military power. In other words, this army wasn't going to go evade Iraq. And so, interesting here, you bought your own gun, and the states appointed the officers. Washington and the army didn't do that. The states did. And the governors controlled the militias. Well, that, no, we're talking back 1792 with a single shot musket. Oh, no, no, that, that's way in the future. But it shows you the state of the country then versus the state of the country now. And so whenever I hear the National Guard being, say, the, you know, the well-regulated militia, no, they're not. They're a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. I make, that, I make that point when we start talking about that up in Army Aviation Magazine. I said, we don't have a well-regulated militia anymore as originally intended. It's gone. The National Guard is not the well-regulated militia. They're a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. That's what they are. That, that goes with the, uh, the changes in the country. That's where that goes. So is it an issue that needs to be discussed? Of course it does. Of course it does. Uh, it's one of the many issues we need to discuss here. Soberly, soberly if that's possible. So like the Electoral College needs to be discussed, like uh, you know, uh, uh, improper searches and seizures, that needs to be discussed. I mean, aren't you guaranteed that in the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution? Improper searches or, searches or seizures, yeah. Should that be maintained? Yeah, of course it should. Of course it should. But that's a citizenry that understands their document here. Yeah, interesting. Fascinating. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Oh, it's a lot of fun. Are you kidding? Thanks for coming. See you next week. Oh, and I